Hello and welcome to the presentation. Let's begin. In this presentation, topics covered will be terminology in the context of diabetes and the anatomy and function of the pancreas. All right, let's go through some of the terminology. All right, so for terminology, this here is a list, but not a full list of the common terms you will come across while studying, while going through the guidelines and going through textbooks. It is important to be familiar with these terms and know what they mean. All right, so for the first one is gluconeogenesis, and the first part is gluco. So what does gluco refer to? Simply, gluco just refers to glucose. All right, next section is neo. What does neo refer to? Neo refers to new. And next, the uh, last component is genesis. So what does genesis mean? It basically refers to formation or creation of something. All right, so let's put this together. So we have gluconeogenesis. So what does that mean? Simply, it means formation of new glucose. All right, let's go through some of the words that are commonly at the end of the term or maybe in the beginning of the term. For example, when we went through gluconeogenesis, the genesis was at the end, which basically was referring to formation. We'll go through this a little bit quickly, So, and then when we go through some other examples of terms, it'll make more sense. So we have lysis, just refers to splitting or breaking apart. And then we have urea, which refers to urine. Keto refers to ketone, for example, in diabetic, keto, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, that's a common word you'll come across. And then uh, hyper just refers to excessive, so like, you know, hypertension, hyperglycemia. Uh, another word is emia. So in the blood, it means it refers to lipo, simply refers to lipid or fat tissue. Atrophy, that refers to decrease in size or wasting away of a tissue, for example. And hypertrophy, which means uh, refers to increase in growth or size of a tissue. All right, so let's go through some of the terms. Again, this is not a full list, but these are common terms to be familiar with. So let's again start out with gluconeogenesis. So again, the gluco refers to glucose, neo refers to new, and genesis refers to formation or creation. So glucose, formation. Uh, remember, gluconeogenesis is just a process that involves transformation of non-carbohydrate sources into glucose. So these sources can include lactate, amino acids, or glycerol. Next we have is glycolysis. So glyco refers to sugar, or in this context, glucose. And lysis refers to splitting. So glucose splitting. Uh, remember glycolysis is a common metabolic pathway in cells where energy is uh, made in the form of ATP. Next is we have glycogenesis. So basically this, basically this refers to glycogen, and genesis refers to formation. So glycogen, formation. Remember, this is a common um, occurrence in the liver and the muscle cells, and it's basically just the storage form of glucose. Next is we have glycogenolysis. So the basically, it's, it's just the opposite of the above, of the genesis. So glycogen and lysis refers to splitting. So glycogen, splitting. And basically, it's glycogen being broken down into the end product of glucose. Next we have is ketonuria, so this refers to ketone, and the urea refer refers to in the urine, so ketones in the urine. Remember that ketones are, are just metabolic end products from fatty acid metabolism, and this is especially important in diabetic ketoacidosis, or also called DKA. Next is we have glycose urea, so again the glyco refers to the sugar or glucose, and urea refers to in the urine, so glucose in the urine. Next, we have hyperinsulinemia. So hyper refers to excessive or high amounts. Insulin refers to insulin. And emia refers to in the blood. So excessive or high amounts of insulin in the blood. Next, we have lipoatrophy. So lipo refers to fat or lipid tissue. Atrophy refers to decrease or wasting away of lipid tissue. Next, we have is lipohypertrophy. And again, lip, lipo refers to lipid or fat tissue, and hypertrophy refers to increase in growth or size of lipid tissue. Remember, uh, with lipoatrophy and lipohypertrophy, these are 
uh, important things to know in reference to people who inject insulin in the same position on repeated occasions. This can lead to lumps or thickened, hardened tissue in that particular area. And this is important in that it can actually affect the absorption of insulin in that particular area. And for this reason, it's important that the sites of injection are rotated. All right, so now we'll go through the pancreas anatomy. All right, before we look at the uh, anatomy of the pancreas, let's look at the organs that surround it. So first off is that we have the liver. Again, the liver is just located just under the rib cage on the right, uh, right side of, the, of your abdomen. It has many functions. Uh, one, of the contact, one of them in this context is the glycogen storage. Uh, next is we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder's role is to store and concent concentrate bile from the liver, and this will play a role in digestion. These, uh, the bile, this will get secreted into the small intestine, which is located right here. This is the first component, so the duodenum of the small intestine. And on the next side here, we have the pancreas. And this, uh, these ducts here are primarily for the exocrine secretions, which will be secreted into the first component of the small intestine. So here we have the pancreas. As you can see, it's a leaf-shaped organ. It's approximately 15 centimeters or 6 inches in length. The pancreas is a dual-function organ in that it has both endocrine and also exocrine cell types. So what are the differences in endocrine versus exocrine? With endocrine, it's important to understand that these glands secrete their products directly into the bloodstream, for example, hormones. And in this, it, this, this context, it would be uh, glucagon, insulin. These are examples. And with exocrine glands, these secrete their products directly into a ductal system. So in this example, enzymes. Other duct systems can include mucus or sweat glands. To point out one thing here is the uh, for the exocrine secretions, these are directly secreted into this duct system here, and it makes its way into this uh, first component of the small intestine. Okay, so let's go through the exocrine functions of the pancreas. These exocrine cells are in grape-like clusters called SNI. These exocrine cells make up approximately 98 to 99 percent of the pancreatic mass. So it's a large chunk of the pancreas. And as we highlighted earlier, its main function is in enzyme secretion. These enzymes are secreted into these ducts here and eventually will make their way into the small intestine or the first component of the small intestine, the duodenum. And these enzymes will aid in digestion. We'll refer to these, uh, these secretions as the pancreatic juice. And in this pancreatic juice, there are various enzymes. So there are enzymes that play a role in protein digestion called proteases. There are lipases for fat digestion and amylases, which is for the carbohydrates and starch digestion. It also has uh, bicarbonate, and bicarbonate is there to help neutralize the acidic food or acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach into the small intestine. Okay, moving on to the endocrine portion. The endocrine cells are in small clusters, and those are called the islets of Langerhans. Again, there are many of these on the pancreas. And the, these islets, uh, the endocrine cells, they comprise about 1 to 2% of the pancreatic mass, whereas with the exocrine, that was about 98 to 99%. And as we highlighted earlier, these cells uh, specialize in hormone release. There are, within these islets, there are various cells, cell types, and these are the alpha, there's also the beta, the delta, gamma, and there is another set of cells called epsilon. Uh, the alpha and beta are more important in, in this context, and we will come to these shortly. All right, let's take a closer look at the pancreas. So here we have a color representation of the various cells within the islet, and we'll start off with the middle, where, is, where we have the uh, purple cells, which are the uh, beta cells, and these comprise about 75% of the islet. 
the surrounding cells, which are blue, these are the alpha cells, and these make up approximately 20% of each islet. And the remaining cells that are surrounding this are the delta and the uh, gamma cells. And these other cells surrounding that are these yellow cells here, which are the exocrine uh, cells. Okay, so let's look at the specific cells of the islets. And starting off is the alpha cells. The alpha cell's main function is to release glucagon. Glucagon is released when our blood glucose levels are low. So for example, when we're fasting, and it, glucagon will help to mobilize glucose and help to increase our blood glucose levels. Next is the uh, beta cells. And beta cells' function is to release insulin. Again, insulin is released when our blood glucose, glucose levels are high. So uh, for example, after we're eating, uh, insulin is released and this will help to bring down our blood glucose levels. Um, insulin does have other functions which will be covered later. Next is the delta cells. And delta cells release a hormone called somatostatin. Somatostatin is also released from the hypothalamus, um, the stomach, the intestines. It acts, as an, an, it acts as an inhibiting hormone in that the pancreatic somatostatin inhibits the release of both glucagon and also insulin. Next is that we have the gamma cells. And the gamma cells release a hormone called pancreatic polypeptide. And this, its main function is in release, uh, it regulating both the endocrine and also the exocrine functions. It may have a possible role in appetite in that it helps to decrease food consumption. Now moving on to the epsilon cells, this releases a hormone called ghrelin and it actually helps to stimulate hunger. So it's doing the opposite uh, of the pancreatic polypeptide. So with the islets, they're surrounded by a rich supply of blood vessels. And this is important, so the beta cells, the alpha cells, when they release their hormones, they can, the hormones can directly enter the blood circulation and reach their target tissue. All right, that concludes the presentation. I hope you found this helpful, and thanks for watching. Music